The Cape Elizabeth um, School Board meeting, uh, Tuesday, March 9th. Um, and if we would stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, we do have uh, one adjustment to our agenda tonight, and that is at the end of this public meeting, um, there were some items that we didn't finish in our finance committee meeting, so the board will be going back to finance. Um, approval for the February school board meeting, I mean the school board minutes, sorry. The, Elaine? Yep, I move that we accept the uh, February school board minutes um, as written. Okay. Second. 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 Kathy. All approved. Seven. Zero. Six. Zero. Sorry. There's an empty chair. Um, okay. We can move on to comments from our students. And it looks as though we will not have our high school students here tonight. Um, <laughs> they are at a fashion show. So we will move on to Kevin. Oh, yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kevin Johnson, and Nora couldn't make it for some reason, I don't know. But um, the dance scheduled for February 6th was officially canceled. The staff tried very hard to get a new date for it, but just too many conflicts. And many students were disappointed. Um, the, there's a social coming up this Friday, and it will be held at the high school, and they'll have the usual open gym and open swim. The musical Bye Bye Birdie tickets just went on sale. And they're a whopping five dollars this year, which should indicate a great show. Eighth graders took MEA testing last week, and even though they weren't taken on the laptops, everyone still thought they were hard and stuff. And they fought through it. The fifth, sixth, and seventh graders took the CATs, and even though it's not their favorite week, they got through it also. Indoor track is at its midpoint right now, and They've won both of their meets that they've attended, but the big highlight of the year was beating the heavy favorite Gorham by 100 points. The girls' basketball season was wrapped up today, and even though they only won one game, all the girls had fun. Uh, one of the students' favorite events of the year was last Friday, the Wonder Years, and everyone had a great time and hopefully learned something too. The eighth grade band was invited to play in front of Maine Congress up in Augusta on March 14th, 24th. And everyone is excited for this opportunity, but mostly excited to miss the day of school. <laughs> <laughs> the third trimester came to a close last Friday, and report cards will come out next Tuesday. And the whole school is ready for the home stretch to summer vacation. Any questions? Questions or comments? None. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Then we'll move on to um, communications, and in everyone's packet, uh, we received an approval letter from Commissioner Gendron regarding um, the approval of our building and renovation projects. Um, I also uh, would like to um, update everyone on where we are in terms of our superintendent search. and. Um, the school board has formed a subcommittee to oversee the details of the search. Um, that subcommittee is represented by myself as, as the chair of that committee, Kevin, Ann, and Kathy. Um, since uh, the, the, the school board met last, we have met with uh, Maine School Management Association and the New England School Development Council. And at this point, we are in the process of obtaining a proposal to have the two of them work together with us. Um, MSMA working um, in the state of Maine and NESDEC uh, would recruit um, in New England and beyond in, in, the, um, in the country. 
Um, this Friday is a target date uh, that we have to start submitting ads um, and have them posted on various websites. Kathy has put um, that information together for us and um, with approval with the subcommittee we can start um, getting our ads. Now that's submitting the ads. The first ad uh, won't appear until March 24th. Um, let me see. Anne. Anne is working and is in the process of uh, working on a brochure which we will be sending out um, with people who have requested um, application forms and the brochure just has information about our school system, about the community um, and uh, our student population, mission statement, vision statement, that type of information. Um, Kevin has also been responsible for pulling together a team, an interview committee team, which we have determined will be 16 people. All seven members of the school board will be part of the interview team. We have asked um, the four administrators, uh, the three building principals, and the special ed director to be part of that committee. And the principals will choose uh, one teacher from each of their schools to represent their schools on the committee. We are also asking um, community members who are interested in serving on this committee to write a letter with their intent and qualifications to the school board. And I believe that Kevin has already um, posted some of this information um, on the website and has been in contact with newspapers to get um, the information out. Each of our uh, 16 members of the interview committee will, it will be necessary to sign confidentiality statements um, from each member. Kevin has also been responsible for getting out a survey um, to the staff and the community um, for input on the qualifications that we're looking for um, for a new superintendent. So as of right now, those are the things that um, we have put together and uh, next we will be working on um, our timeline to accomplish everything. Are there any other communications? Just a quick question. Yes. Gary, did you make that slide? Super my man. Um, the web address for the superintendent um, attribute survey will be flashed later at the meeting up on uh, as part of Gary's presentation. It will be on all the newspapers, uh, in all of the newspapers as well over the next few days. Okay. Um, is there anything I missed, Kevin or Kathy or Ann? Okay. I don't think so. Um, okay, then we can move on. Comments from the public? We, um, we don't have any time? No? no. Okay, then we can move on to recognition. Um, actually, Tom has, um, Tom Frisella has been nominated and accepted as a member of the suburban school superintendents. What that is, um, is a select group of superintendents who serve quality districts in a high performance manner and advocate for change and continuous improvement in their school districts. This is a group of no more than a hundred superintendents from across the country and a new nomination is made um, as a superintendent leaves. So the, the total never exceeds a hundred. Tom is the only superintendent in Maine which was invited to join this group. And I'm not sure if there's ever been a superintendent from Maine. I don't know. Okay. So. All right. The obligation um, for his membership requires uh, a superintendent to be active in educational leadership, knowledgeable about the education research, and a willingness to participate in an annual meeting of the group. And, and I think that this is um, a wonderful thing, and I think we should acknowledge Tom for being part of this. Thank you. 
Um, the superintendent's report. Tom. A couple of things. Um, one, as you can see, it's that time of year when we hear about retirements, and this year we have a number. Um, so just to let you know, um, we have at the Pond Cove, Dottie Anderson and uh, Lynn Evans and Linda Nickerson, uh, who have uh, notified us of their plans to retire. Beverly Bisbee um, at the middle school and an ed tech, Nancy Scott. And what we normally do is at our last, I think our last meeting of the year, we have, we take some time out from our meeting and invite um, all of the people that are retiring or, or have been here for a number of years and uh, we recognize them and we take a little break and uh, do that at our last meeting. So we'll be inviting all those people who are retiring to our last meeting of the year. Um, and the second thing I have this evening, um, at the beginning of the year, and I know when the new school board members came on board, we talked quite a bit about hearing more about some of the programs, not just that we're running in our schools, or some of the changes, curriculum related issues, not just at our workshops, but maybe taking some time at our meetings to do that. So this evening, um, for those of you who were here last year, um, we, we took a look at the, the middle school I mean, the elementary school and how it's organized as far as administration and the, the, the staff at Pond Cove, uh, led by Tom Eismeyer, uh, really took a look at what the duties and responsibilities were of the administrative team at that school and tried to come up with a way to um, focus a little bit more on curriculum uh, and professional development, which really wasn't a major emphasis of the the former position known as the assistant principal. So we created a teacher leader position. Um, and we are well into that, um, three quarters of the way approximately through the year. And so uh, Tom and Kelly Hassan, who was in that position, are here to talk to you a little bit about how it's been going. So Tom and Kelly. Um, good evening. First of all, thanks for taking the time to let us do this. I think it's an exciting project. And if you haven't, I think you already know Kelly Hassan, who has taught grade one and grade two, is now the teacher leader. So as I wanted to first uh, follow up on what Tom said, give you a little history of the position, and acquaint you with some of the facets of the job that Kelly has been doing. And then we'd be happy to give you more details and field questions at the end of the, of the little presentation. We get it on? Just the, the outline for tonight would be a little more elaboration on the thinking behind this, where it came from, why we have such a position. After I talked to Tom and Sarah Simmons, what we decided we'd be looking for in the job, what we currently have, I think is a treasure. And at the end, uh, things to think about as the, the job became more clearly defined during the year, we're learning more and more about how to make it better and maybe we learn some things to avoid. Part of this um, impetus came from looking hard at the uh, work we did around future directions planning. Um, and Tom has pointed out on numerous occasions, we're kind of a lean district. We're not very top heavy in administration or professional development. The first step toward uh, improving that is getting Sarah Simmons at the district level. But Sarah does K through 12. And even though she is housed in uh, one building at the moment, it was the uh, wish of the people who worked on that strategic planning to have professional development available to teachers close to the ground, point of purchase, where teachers really do their work in each building. But for budgetary reasons, we were kind of putting that off. Um, as Tom mentioned, when we're thinking about the things we've done at Pond Cove, I'm sure they're happening for the two buildings too. You may have heard about the literacy initiative. We have been involved in at Pond Cove for a number of years. So it was kind of fertile ground to improve the inquiry there. And we've also done a lot of work with uh, professional development really having an impact on teaching and we hope on student learning. And 
we feel on COVID, the atmosphere was becoming more collegial, that we're slowly but surely moving away from hierarchy administration toward having a learning community. We've got a lot of goals, but there we were. I like this rotation so much, you have to suffer through it. <laughs> Give me a chance to read it. <coughs> so there we were, I think, with these uh, initiatives happening, good things happening with leadership, and the staff development on code, but it, there comes a time, and it's usually through the budget, where I think we have to look again at the resources we have. So we looked at the, the uh, structure of the administration at Pond Cove, and if the goal really was for teaching and learning, we thought we might be able to change the wallpaper a little bit and do something a little different because there was a chance it might work for Pond Cove. From my perspective, I've always wrestled as a principle of finding a balance between country and leadership and management. The trains have to run on time, and in this case, the buses have to run on time. And it's part of the administrative responsibility to do that. It's also the administrative responsibility really to focus on teaching and learning. Part three is I can only do that, or any principal can only do that, with the cooperation and the full participation of, of the whole staff. Current term for that is distributed leadership. Leadership from the classroom to my office in a kind of reciprocal way. That's some of the words we're going to change the wallpaper. We, hope. <laughs> we looked around at other models. All the models are a little different depending on the size of the district and the school and, and the current needs of the organization. But Tom and Sarah and I knew that if we needed an exemplary practitioner currently working at Punk Cove. It would be next to impossible for someone to come in, you know, a great teacher could come in from another district, but it would take a long time to build up the personal relations and the trust and the confidence. So we were looking in-house to do that. Uh, it turned out on a practical basis, we'd like to rotate this job. That it would, our thinking was, last for two years. Recruit from within, someone can be a teacher leader for two years, go back to be a classroom teacher. That was the model we were working with. We were looking for somebody who's not just exemplary in the classroom, but has some kind of track record of a teacher of teachers. Somebody who had shown some leadership at the building level working with grown-ups. And somebody who would also have some sensitivity about helping groups figure out problems on their own. Um, guide reflective thinking. So we searched. And we looked for somebody, when we got more serious, somebody who could work with teachers in the classroom, which is critical. If teachers are trying out new curriculum or new methods, they really need somebody in there besides me to uh, help them as they work with their students. Somebody could work with groups of teachers, and, and Pond Cove could be grade level teams, could be the faculty. Someone who could help out back to the future direction plan with the district and school programs that are underway. And we also realized going into this that without a pretty strong definition in the beginning, there'd be a lot of pressure to turn the job into something we, maybe we didn't want. So that's the test issue. What happens when uh, there's an emergency at school or something else comes up. So we knew up front we'd have to be flexible about what was going on and define it as we went along. Person would also, we were thinking about the structure of the school and where the leadership pockets are now would be a standing member of team leaders. That's uh, each grade level, pupil service team, allied arts. This teacher leader uh, be a member of the teacher assistance team, which helps teachers and parents with strategies for helping kids in the classroom at home. Be part of the district team, the CIA team, the curriculum and instruction assessment team, and be part of the district leadership team. Um, what we were thinking about was, since we, it's not just learning results, but national standards, and we have had success with programs like Everyday Math, which are linked to national standards, that this person would have some expertise in standards and be able to help the teacher do that. The learning results. A big, uh, you know, it's a challenge for all three schools. I put this slide up there because the needs of Pond Cove are a little different. We're more, we're generalists. All the teachers teach everything. And we, we like things like that chart up there. I don't think Jeff would be doing this at the high school. So the, the, the post-its and things make more sense to us at Pond Cove. This is an exercise that Kelly led us through to make some sense of the local assessment system. That, to me, is one of the strengths of having somebody from the staff, working with staff, and knowing what the learning style of the staff is. The teacher leader, Kelly, um, helps with content knowledge. We're supposed to know everything about everything, and we don't. 
the, this is the fourth grade team working on a physics unit. And you can see the title of the book, Stop Faking It. They're not going to fake it anymore. They needed some content background. And the way for elementary teachers to do it was to do it piece by piece and actually play with that equipment and learn about Newton's rules. Craft knowledge is, uh, we have gotten a lot stronger in the past few years about looking at practice in the classroom. It's almost a taboo in a lot of schools because practice is so private. But those are just almost, this slides off the hard drive of teachers, observing teachers doing a lesson in the background and then talking about it together. Afterwards. And the teacher leader helps with that. One of the things we took on this year was a, a phonics program. You've heard a lot about the phonics and the No Child Left Behind. This happens to fit with the way we teach teaching and writing, too. And at the elementary level, the way we do it, the actual material we use, how we do it, the colors we use, the charts, and all those things are very, very important. Kelly's helped organize this. She's gotten the right material. She's shown videos to people to see how other teachers do it. And we have taped people doing it so they could get better at this. And we think this program is worth doing. It was a pilot project this year, and we hope to do it um, in all the, in grades K1 and 2 generally next year. Without a teacher leader, we have not we would not have made that progress. We have been talking about this, and I think Marie brought it up at the last board meeting about how some kind of more visible standards for teaching reading and writing. And we have been back and forth about how to do it. We've approached it through assessment, but now I think we're going to look exact, look harder about how we actually teach it. That's going to be our next frontier. Kelly's already started doing this. She's done model lessons using um, this series, which is K2, taking the model lesson, which can be theoretical, and going into a classroom with kids and doing it and debriefing with the teachers. Those are all the good things. Um, there have been opportunity costs. You know, Tom and I have talked about, you know, maybe I want to bail this November. I think it would be too hard by November, perhaps, with too many complaints about no heat and so on. But in this district, it happens to work that I can do this. If I make a quick call, because I now do the things that the assistant principal used to do, maintenance is always there to help. Transportation is always there to help. And I have to say, the teachers are really caught on the idea very quickly about how we're kind of sharing this. It's a good thing for everybody. We've changed our roles a little bit. So the, the demand so far has been reasonable, which is nice to know. But I think it's a a tribute to the spirit of this district. When you're small and you work together, you can be very flexible. We have been trying, to would say keeping account, trying to keep track of what Kelly does and doesn't do. We talk all the time about, should Kelly be doing this? Is this in my domain? Let's try it and see how it works, and we're keeping track of that. And we have a plan at least to get feedback and evaluation from the teachers about how this has worked for them, teachers' perception of how this helped them. Um, looking ahead, I think this has been a great thing. It's great for me, I think and Kelly will speak to it too. It's really good for Kelly or any other teacher's position to see, see what the school is like from that perspective. Uh, the teachers have really stepped up with this. They, they call on Kelly services. They're not uh, hesitant about having their practice scrutinized publicly. Um, it, it seems to be working generally in the building. One thing I think we need to do more is look around and provide the teacher leader, Kelly in this case, more support for what she's doing. I think the current term for this probably is a staff development teacher, which is the closest I can get to describing what she does. And there are groups around the country that are kind of coalescing around this. So if we pursue this, the teacher leader needs some support too, we need somebody to talk to. And the, the last part is, it, 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 you shouldn't be paying for this unless we're getting student results. I think we are, but we're going to track it through our assessment to see where we started and how the, I know the teachers are benefiting and how the, how the uh, kids are benefiting from this. That's a long-term project, but I think we're going to see results right away. I think that's, you don't want to see that's enough, right there. Um, that's the kind of dry part. I hope I haven't bored you too much, but the, the live part is Kelly, and maybe she can give you her perspective on what's going on. Um, I think Tom covered the position very well. Um, very many times, it's, a, it's somewhat of a balancing act because it has many facets to it. But I, I'll just speak briefly and then answer any questions that you have about um, any components of my position. One of the pieces that um, Tom was talking to you about when he was showing 
some of the new initiatives we're doing, the phonics program, which is, is, is also called the word study continuum because it, it connects also to things like high frequency words, um, spelling patterns, and other components of word study in, in addition to phonics. Um, and it, as well as the new writing program that we're looking at is because I'm not an evaluator of teachers, teachers are more open to me coming into classrooms. And it's very important that I get in those classrooms. The research really overwhelmingly um, shows that improvement of instruction happens when there is a, a, somewhat a mentor, a, a teacher leader, a staff developer going into classrooms and working side by side with teachers, whether it's, as Tom mentioned, model lessons, which I am doing a lot of um, the next few weeks with second grade on their writing and this new program that we're using. And it, it shows, the research supports that they are much more likely to change or, or improve practices or reflect on what they're doing when there is an, when there's a person such as myself going in there working with them versus me doing a workshop demonstrating without any students there of now take this back and go back to your classrooms and do this. Uh, it doesn't quite work as effectively as if there's a person right in there. So that's been very rewarding to see how excited they are to collaborate. Uh, I went in this morning to a second grade class with Janet Amberger's room, did a model lesson. She then team taught with me as we were going around during this writing workshop with the second graders. Later that afternoon, we had a team meeting with second grade teachers to tell them, sort of debrief of how it went. Tomorrow I do a follow-up lesson in her room. That at, tomorrow afternoon I go in and do it, you know, begin with another second grade class. I'm doing it with all the second grade classrooms. In addition to that, I'm going into kindergarten classrooms tomorrow um, but in, in terms of the word study continuum. So it's a very busy position, but it, it, it's been working out very well. The local assessment system piece is a, is a really, really big part of this. And I've been working very closely with Sarah Simmons. Um, our late start day on Monday, I'm leading the teachers with local assessment work on Monday, and that is um, connecting directly to our work on March 22nd, our staff day, which is for K-12, all local, local assessment work. So it's, um, it's multifaceted, but I'm really enjoying it. And I, I think we're seeing, seeing real results. And I think, as Tom said, we'll, we'll know more at the end of the year as, as we collect data and see the comparisons. So if you have any questions or anything that Tom has um, shown you on his um, presentation that you'd like me to answer, I can clarify. And what kind of um, background or what kind of training or what kind of development did you have that you brought into this role? Well, um, as far as um, education, I have a child development degree from the University of Maine. I have a master's degree in language and literacy from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And I have... <laughs> Not so much your credentials. Your, your credentials are precede where you are. But yeah. what, what did you... Did you have... Uh, like a life experience in this kind of leadership role, or was it something that was uniquely created for you um, and trying to tap into your own? Skills? Yeah, um, I was a team leader for first grade. Mm -hmm. Also, um, numerous, Mary Brands can speak to all the committees that I've served on since my tenure here. Um, currently, I serve on the um, Curriculum Instruction and Assessment Committee, but that is also an extension of many other committees that we've had. There was, well, we had a literacy committee here for a while. It was mm. kind of like the Supreme Court. It, you, it just, you know, you, you just never got off that committee, you know, <laughs> so, and it sort of evolved into different names, but it was always still devoted mm. to, you know, our, our um, instruction in literacy. So there's been constant work like that. So when we, we would look for, you know, say my replacement someday, we would look for someone who has shown evidence of leading teachers in, mm. in these kinds of roles. There was an application process, and um, we had several teachers apply for this position, and there was an, inter an interview team that <laughs> spoke to the teachers. It's a two-year position. The whole idea is uh, to bring teachers out of the classroom for two years in, in a leadership capacity. It's, 
it's not so much maybe that some of them have had experience with it, it's but to gain, ex mm -hmm. gain experience in this area. Um, I think our goal also is at, at, at this juncture, uh, the expertise that Kelly happened to have in her background fit very well with where we are right now. Uh, in another year, we, the school may be in a different place, so maybe someone with some, some different things to offer might fit very well into this position as Kelly Book takes back into the classroom. So it's, I think it's, a, it's another way of looking at leadership, promoting leadership within the school. Um, uh, we always run the risk, and we knew that going in, that someone may like it so much that it may be a great experience and we may lose them. Um, but we feel, <laughs> but we feel it's important that you know leadership and teacher leadership is so important because uh, in education and in, in schools it's either usually you're an administrator or you're a teacher. Um, there's no real um, area for for doing something a little different, trying something that's different, uh, trying a different set of skills. So this is part of what this is all about to to try to do that and. Um, and tap into some of the expertise that we have on staff. And because, because I'm a classroom practitioner, I mean, the realities of the classroom are always foremost in my mind when I'm working with teachers and, you know, asking them to try something new or, you know, doing some staff development pieces. I, I'm always keeping in mind, too, this is in addition to what their classroom responsibilities already are. So I have to make sure that I balance that because I'm, you know, 20 plus years in the classroom. I know those demands very well. So it, I think that's a piece that helps working with the, with the teachers. My empathy for what I know their demands are, and certainly certain times of the year, which are more, what are the higher pressure points? You know, say it's conference time or report card time, and just knowing this is not a good time to to do this work at this time and. Um, and also knowing, I mean, in response to like the writing pieces we're doing, um, we're addressing one of the concerns we've had with our MEA scores is that the, the writing piece is not as strong as the other pieces. Doesn't, and, and even though we're higher than the state average, we still would like to see more students meeting the standard. And also, like with the second grade, we're using the data from their fall writing prompt to address the areas, in this case, it's using details and topic development, and that's what my work is directly connected to that, that I'm going in this week and next, work, doing their work. So um, it definitely helps to you know, have that experience. Um, Kelly, so in terms of, is that one of the ways, what you just described in, ter in terms of writing, over the next couple of years, is that how you would assess the, the work that you're doing? Like, how do you, what results are you looking for? Well, I think we're looking for, obviously, gains in, in student work, but I, I, I think it would be hard to measure the effect I have on their gains, and obviously, I would look more closely at, you know, our local assessment system and, and mm -hmm. how we measure that, but my work, as far as helping teachers make benchmarks and correlations on where you know where where we were, where you know what our next step is. That would be more tied to actual student outcomes. Hmm. As far as how improvement of the school overall, Tom and I have talked about doing an evaluation. So so teachers give input on what my role has been, any changes they'd like to see, what improvements they think you know have been made as re, you know that have helped them directly in the classroom. Those are things that we're looking at to help us evaluate the effectiveness of the position. So, in, in order, well, evaluating the effectiveness of the position is one side. Is there any possibility of evaluating um, the performance in the classroom by a team of teachers or a teacher? I mean, is there anything in that direction? There is, Marie, but we're on the frontier with it. Uh, the other schools who have tried it are sort of satisfied with having the position and letting it go. We're, we're gathering the data now. If we, we didn't have a teacher, teacher there last year, we have one this year. We're doing these initiatives, so we measure again next year. Mm -hmm. I can report back to you we're having an impact. Is that answering your question? Yeah. But yeah. there aren't many schools who go out on a limb that way. 
Well, I, I know, I realize that, <laughs> so and we'll that's why I'm asking down. the question. I'm just trying to no, get I, the but feeling I think, of... I think we should be pushed out on that limb. Yeah, but because it's a very good why, question, why, why because it's something it? that, right. obviously, we want to see if this is worthwhile, and, mm -hmm. our, you know, the most worthwhile so I, connection I think to that would be... It'll range from the anecdotal evidence we have from classrooms to teachers gathering evidence to our local assessment system to the MEA, probably. So, and you should hold us to it. I really think so. I have a question. Um, I'm thrilled that we're on track with kind of looking at the goal that we had is getting curriculum development at the school level, as Tom had mentioned, and that we looked at an alternative way to accomplish that. Um, do you see a position such as yours being applicable to the middle school or the high school? Would it be as successful when we are able to measure that type of thing? But I guess that's hard for me to answer because I'm not part of the culture there yeah. and, and don't have, you know, that would be a hard question for me personally to answer. I know I've been approached, you know, by different faculty of both schools asking questions to me about my position, but there, their needs are so different from the elementary school, but it, I, it, that I know has been questioned. So I, but I honestly could not answer, you know, give you my opinion of it because I, I really couldn't. You really feel it. that different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But is this a model that's being used in other elementary schools around the country? Is is that where the concept kind of It is. Kind of it's came different from? in many of them. I mean, we've got a lot they're of. They're all different. Yeah, they're all different, and I have some friends who have done it, uh, you know, in Portland, and there's, their roles have been somewhat different as well. I mean, some, some look more like administrative. Others have very little um, involvement in classrooms. It's more, out, you know, it, it's more external with staff development being external. But, you know, we've looked at it and really want to go with what the research supports and also, you know, what we believe in, I think, philosophically that, you know, it'll, it'll be much more effective being in classrooms as much as possible. Well, I, th I just want to say I think it's really creative and it's taking a risk and I think it's great for us to try different things like this. Well, I, I think we got the right person for the job. The first person gets to define the job and Kelly's really set high standards for it. But, and, Kelly will attest to this. There are days, like on Thursday afternoons, we're thinking, which one of us should have done that, or should we have done that at all? But we're keeping track of where, and it's getting, seems to be getting easier as we go. But to get back to that other point, too, there, there are lots of good initiatives going on at Pond Cove, and we finally, we've been able to connect them to the district and even the state initiatives, too. There's been kind of a missing link. The key to it, about where it'll work, is Kelly has the trust and confidence and the esteem of the staff and they're not threatened when she goes into a classroom and people are willing to say help me out with this. There's no Maytag man syndrome here. People are asking her to command this nice. Maytag person. Oh, pardon me. <gasps> Sorry, Richard. <laughs> well, it sounds great. It sounds like the work that you're doing so far is wonderful. And and it's great to hear that that you're able to go into a classroom, work with everyone and, and that is moving along so well. Actually, it's not always quite that easy. Sometimes Kelly would say, I'm coming. Tell me which day to come, <laughs> which is a little different from, you know, I'll wait for you. Here are the mm -hmm. three days I can come. So, and, you, and I think that's great that you think yeah. that. Yeah. So, and feel free, I mean, at any time, if you see something, you know, in, in uh, any of our newsletters that you want more information about some, some part of my involvement, I mean, feel free to come over and visit, meet with me, you know, call me, email me, you know, I'd be more than happy to, to you know, to expand on what we're doing. So, thanks for your support. And um, I might never leave, so, you know, it might be one of those things. <laughs> What what happens? That's Supreme Court. So. <laughs> what happens if the, at the end of two years you want to continue doing this? You you don't have that option, do you? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. We don't know. We'll that was the original plan. Yeah. We'll, we'll email you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments for? No. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Tom. And Tom, you can stay because yes. we can move on um, to your report. We we take a little longer than the um, middle school and high school to MEA, so officially they ended today. We have makeup exams to do the rest of the week. There is um, 
PCPA book discussion tomorrow night. Uh, we don't have too many takers yet, but if you are available at 6.45 tomorrow night, even if you haven't read the book, The Second Parent, it's about uh, media influence with children. Anybody who saw the Super Bowl halftime might want to come to that meeting. So that's the news from Pond Cove. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Questions or comments for Tom? Thanks for your time. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we can move on to Jeff at the high school. I want to uh, clarify, um, Rebecca and Mike are at the fashion show tonight. Um, they're actually in the fashion show tonight. So they are walking down the stage. I'm not sure if they're arm in arm. I'm not sure how that's working, but um, they are it's, it's a first effort to put on a real, very stylish, high-class fashion show. Um, um, retailers in the Portland area have provided the tuxedos, the dresses, and that sort of thing. So it becomes, a, and it's also a fundraiser on behalf of the junior class. So I'm hoping that they're um, having a good time and raising some money over there. So it's, it sounds like a really neat event. Um, this is... A lot of these events, a lot of these special events on, at the high school level take place during this three to four week period, depending on how our playoffs go, three to four week period between the end of the winter season and the beginning of the spring season. So it very often feels like it's a race. I mean, it, 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 it's, at, it's event after event after event. Um, one of the reasons why Ted Jordan decided to schedule his trip to Washington, D.C. starting actually today is because it's during that in-between in time during the sports season. So he is gone. Um, some of you may have caught the one-act play, Black Snow, uh, that was the student production uh, this winter. If you weren't able to catch it um, last week, I'm, I think, according to Mr. Mullen, there will be some other opportunities coming up in the next week or so. Uh, we do have the fashion show tonight. Um, last Saturday at Boston at the Heinz Auditorium was the Berkeley Jazz Festival. Um, and our five in a row streak of coming in first place in our category did come to an end, uh, but not without, but not with any disappointment particularly or surprise. Uh, I think the group knew going in that this was going to be a rebuilding year. They performed very well. There were 19 bands in the category that the Cape with Jazz Ensemble is a part of. Uh, and we came in fourth out of those 19 bands. So it was a really very good performance by a, a, a young group uh, this year. It did feature, the featured performers were uh, senior James Francescone um, and freshman Parker Marvin. Um, and it was a good example of collaboration, I would say, between the high school and the middle school because two of the three charts that were, that's what jazz people call these things, they don't call them compositions, but two of the three charts that were played under the direction of Tom Lazat, who's the high school jazz ensemble director, were actually arranged by middle school band director Terry White. So that's a really nice connection that we have uh, to well, have Terry services in, in uh, really adapting um, charts to the strengths and the needs of our groups. And I'm also, the fe one of the featured performers uh, was, featured soloist, was John Bonus Parker Marvin, who actually was given the judges award for our group as being the, the best musician um, as a freshman from the Cape Elizabeth High School Jazz Ensemble. That, so that certainly speaks well of the talent that's coming up from the lower grade levels and the interest in jazz that continues to, uh, to be very much um, a center of activity around in music at the high school. So it was very exciting to watch. We, we also did finish our MEAs as well um, today. And we're also, like Pond Cove, in the middle of catching kids up uh, where they missed this portion or that portion of the exam. The stakes for that are significantly higher. Um, and I'm sure, along with the other two schools, we are taking that very seriously, trying to find ways to give, to encourage, motivate, um, give kids incentives to make sure they complete all the portions of the exam because we do have to come reach the 95% threshold that the No Child Left Behind Act requires us to meet for all sections of the exam in order to avoid being identified as a failing school, not because of how well our kids did or didn't do, but just because of what percentage of kids happen to be absent from particular portions of the exam. So that, that work is happening, and uh, there's a lot of time being spent meeting with, with Bob Howe from HK, HKTA Associates. Um, 
I think we have our locker room organization about 98% done. There's some very minor tweaking to happen. We had a, uh, the last, I think, major meeting around the locker room, which was the most complex area to redesign. Um, and, and I'm really pleased with the results, and I think the coaches and PE instructors um, and community services people and all the, all the folks involved in that discussion are, are going to be very pleased with it. Um, tomorrow we have what may be or may not be a wrap-up discussion around the reorganization, the administration and guidance areas, and tomorrow we start the discussion about the consolidation and reorganization of uh, rooms which will be for the first time specially adapted to the needs of special education and the teachers and students and special services because up until this point we've really been um, adapting a building that really wasn't designed for the needs of special services, special education. Uh, that's not, and so there's always been constant change, flux, movement and everything else and hopefully the home that uh, is created will be more permanent and really able to fit the needs for very significant period of time. So those are some of the major things happening at the high school. Okay. Thank you. Thank Any you. questions or comments for Jeff? None? Okay, thank you, Jeff. Nancy, middle school. Good evening. Well, as Kevin said, we did finish our tests last week. Uh, we were also in the process of making them up. All of our students either did California Achievement Tests or the MEAs. He also um, let you know that we did not participate in the online testing for the writing, and that was because we could not get a consistent connection for all of our students to stay connected during the writing process, and we wanted to be sure that everybody was testing under the same conditions. I do know in speaking with the middle school principal at Falmouth that they were able to get a consistent connection, and they did um, do the online writing. I'm going to be seeing her again next week and find out some more about that. I had a very brief chat with her last Tuesday, but she said they did have a few glitches, but it had worked okay for them. I know for several other schools, Yarmouth and some others, they also made the same choice we did because of that connection. But I do anticipate that in 2005, those glitches will be cleared up and we will be online and moving forward with a new experience with the MEAs. In the middle school for those testing weeks, we do need to work with our students because everyone in our school um, will be involved in either what is known as the mini MEAs or the MEAs, and we want students to take them seriously without developing a serious case of text, test anxiety. So we'll be working with that. Now to help us out, to show that it's a true partnership around here, um, as Kevin said, the best day of the week was Friday because we had the Wonder Years. And Ann Belvin um, brought the Wonder Years to us, I think, four years ago as an idea that we began to plan on for those. And then we delivered our first one two years ago with Ann's committee. And then on Friday had another spectacular day. In fact, one of the humorous comments of the day is um, some of the presenters who were there, um, parents from other communities, came up to some members of the committee and said, now, do you provide these conferences for other schools too? Do you have a business and, and do this? Um, in which the parents laughed and said, uh, no. <laughs> but very willing to talk with any other school who would like to start their own effort in that way. And I think we really came, the committee came up with a great balance of keynote speakers with Randy Judkins first um, and doing full steam ahead and then ending up with Wayne Soares, um, who was also a speaker, but a, a performer, a storyteller as well. And I think it brought nice closure to the conference. Skimming through the feedback forms that the students have filled out, I think they've given us some good suggestions of ways to go in the future, but also generally a very positive experience. We did have some people who were concerned because they didn't get their first choices. Some of them have not remembered that clearly what their first choices were, and they did get them. We also did have a few presenters who canceled at the last moment, and we did have to move people around. So everybody worked together very well, and it was a wonderful day at the middle school. Kathy, I know you had a chance to be there for a short amount of time. Ann was there the whole day. Richard was one of our presenters. So um, it is a great opportunity and an, an example of the education community of Cape Elizabeth being the entire community coming together and offering something for its young people. So thank you, Ann, for your idea, your energy, and your commitment to us. And we look forward to the next one. So you do have you know, a little, little time off before we start beginning with that. Um, for our 
fifth and sixth graders, they're excited because we have a social coming up on Friday and they're hoping it doesn't get snowed out because as Kevin shared with you two people were disappointed we weren't able to figure out how to have a makeup dance for our February event. But um, we're looking forward to the social. And the student council is being very creative because they have realized that a number of the student council members are also on our track team and they have a meet at the expo at the same time. So once again, it will be a little bit of that creativity at the middle school, but we'll get everything done. Next Monday, we are hosting a meeting for our accelerated programming in mathematics and language arts with the target audience of our incoming fifth grade families. However, anybody who's in the middle school and is, would like to candidate for those programs is invited, and we have a snow date of Tuesday, March 16th. At the same time, our eighth graders, I think, have now received their invitations from the high school to go to the high school open house to hear about becoming freshmen. So even as we get into spring and we're still working hard on this current school year, we're also looking ahead to the future. Jeff mentioned the jazz band and Terry White working closely with Tom Luzot. Um, and that is a wonderful thing to see. They come, Terry gets to go down to the high school. Sometimes Tom comes up and works with our seventh and eighth grade band. It's really, it's great to see that continuity. Our seventh and eighth grade students who participated in the honors concerts for both the band and chorus presented their concert in Scarborough on Saturday, February 28th. Unfortunately, I was unable to go because it occurred during our budget meeting, but I did hear from Rebecca Bean and Terry White that it went very well and our students were very well behaved um, and noticeably better behaved than a few of the students who were asked not to return. So that was nice to hear that we weren't in that group. Family conference letters should be going out from homeroom teachers and advisors as right around April 1st we'll be doing family conferences and wanting to make contact with all of our families once again about the progress their sons and daughters are making at the middle school. Our report cards for our second trimester go out next Tuesday and also will be the course checkoff sheets for our incoming seventh and eighth graders to fill out for next year. And just to follow up, as Kevin mentioned, we do have Bye Bye Birdie coming up. Each time I come up, I like to invite you to the next event. I, the only month I don't really have one is June. Oh, no, I, I take that back. I do have one in June I can invite you to, so good. This will be consistent. Um, bye Bye Birdie, and we have <coughs> four performances, so we hope you'll be able to make one of those. Uh, we have an evening performance on April 2nd at 7 p.m., two performances on April 3rd, it's a Saturday, 2 p.m. and 7 p.m., and also a performance on Sunday, April 4th at 2 p.m. We will be doing another performance for our school audience on Monday morning, April 5th, but quite honestly, with all of our students in the cafetorium, we will be, there will be extremely limited seating. So um, if that's the only one you can make, come and we'll find a chair for you, I promise. But um, hopefully you'll be able to make one of the other performances as well. Students have been working hard and having a good time. We're getting close to that time where we're a little bit jittery about how will it come off. And you know what? It always does. And the most important thing is students do their best and have fun. And I would be remiss tonight if I stopped before just mentioning two of our teachers. I know we're going to mention them again later for people who are retiring. But just to clarify, Nancy Scott, who's one of our ed tech ones, her retirement is actually effective a year from now, February 1st, 2005, when her authorization runs out. But being the professional that she is, she wanted to be sure that everybody had the information beforehand. I think for myself, Beverly Bisbee's letter that she wrote um, of her retirement really speaks to the kind of person Beverly Bisbee is. Um, she is certainly, people have been running around for the last couple of weeks saying, did she really retire? Do you think she's really going to do it? Because Beverly's talked about this before. But she is such a critical person in our middle school that they're secretly hoping now nah, she won't really go. She won't really go. Well, Beverly is going to move on and do that. But as part of being a teacher of teachers, one of her biggest gifts to us is not only her modeling in the classroom and her connection to students, but also her absolute enthusiasm of helping us all use our laptops as tools, not for the machine it is, but for the openings that it gives us in learning and in teaching. And she's been an invaluable resource to us. So. We will miss her, but we'll send her off in good speed. And I know that um, you will also recognize her towards the end of the year as well. And I believe that's the latest news from the middle school. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Any comments or questions for Nancy? No? Nope. Okay. Thank you, Nancy.
Now we can move on to our committee reports. Um, the Finance Subcommittee, Elaine. Uh, yes, the Finance Subcommittee uh, met prior to this evening's meeting uh, where we signed warrants and reviewed the appropriations report. Um, we also did meet back uh, on that Saturday in February with the district leadership team where we were presented uh, the budget in its entirety uh, for the, our first consideration. Um, it was also done in conjunction with the Thursday workshop because it is a lengthy process. Um, but overall, the budget, um, as most of the public know, um, did come in uh, at a 12.4 percent increase. Um, and I just wanted to make the statement that um, I believe that the district leadership team did a great job representing the students' needs uh, for the upcoming school year. And we did ask them to um, be cognizant of the goal that we had uh, presented to us by town council to come as close as we could to 8%. Um, after looking at the budget, the school board uh, did ask the district leadership team to go back and take a closer look at that budget um, to see whether we could get any closer. Um, and I know that they're going to be meeting this week uh, with Tom and that we will hopefully in turn, the finance subcommittee will meet next week and we'll take a, another preliminary look at what you've come back with. And then the school board will again see that uh, budget uh, on our workshop on the 26th, the Tuesday. Um, and 23rd, or is it 26th? I can't. 23rd. 23rd. Um, and so that um, we'll have a couple more chances to get where we need to, do, to be um, and hopefully still meet what we need to. So um, thank you for working together with that. And that's uh, the report from the finance. OK, thank you, Elaine. Um, policy, Ian. Our policy committee met on March 2nd. And as I've stated in the past, what the policy committee does is work off a work plan that's been developed and established at the beginning of a year. So there are a number of policies that we've been working on for the past several months, which I'll get into. Um, in addition to those policies, however, this month, we had two contacts from parents in the community asking us to review a couple of policies. The first one was um, a request to review food allergy guidelines at Pond Cove and to consider developing a policy on this. Um, it, when a parent contacts the committee, it doesn't necessarily mean that we will take that issue up in the committee at that time. What the committee does is decide how it wants to dispense with the issue. If it, if it wants to prioritize it to that level to discuss it right then or put it on a work plan at some other time. In this case, we did, we did discuss it. Paula Harris came to our committee that day and presented this very specific um, guidelines that Pond Cove currently works under in terms of responding to food allergy situations at the school. Um, there was you know, some discussion about it. I, it, it seems that it's not quite as big of an issue at the middle school and the high school because, of course, kids are a lot more self-sufficient at that stage. Um, it, the, the guidelines are also sort of a work in, in progress. They're constantly being updated and monitored, and um, the school is constantly making sure that we're really responding to the growing needs um, of this population that's happening across the country right now. Food allergies have really grown, and schools have to address it. Um, what, what the committee decided was that Tom will take, Tom Forcello will review and take a look at policies that might exist in other schools. And then at that time, we'll look at those policies and decide whether we need to establish a system-wide policy that would direct the development of specific guidelines for our schools. The second request was um, by a parent to review the policy regarding awarding high school credit prior to a student entering grade nine. Um, the committee also discussed that policy at the time. I see that there are a couple of parents here who I believe are interested in addressing that. And um, there is going to be a recommendation in terms of the current policy, a change to our current policy, which will be further on down the agenda. With, um, when we get to that, you'll have an opportunity to address it at that time. OK, so moving on to our current um, the current work plan. 
The first policy that we discussed was the conflict of interest and nepotism policies. As I mentioned before, um, we've been working on this for several months. And Jeff presented a draft of two separate policies, one for conflict of interest, the other for nepotism, both working off of our two current policies that exist at this time. And then within those, there are some options um, and for several paragraphs within those policies. We're going to be presenting those later on in the agenda for um, first, uh, first reading and consideration. And then the second policy, which we briefly discussed, is the diversity policy, which also is on our work plan. Um, Tom contacted Portland and Lewiston to see if those two school districts had policies on this. And it, those policies don't exist for those schools. I guess apparently it's just something that's sort of constantly being dealt with, and it, they don't feel that there's a need for that within their school district. Um, we're going to be talking about that next month at our next month's meeting and think about the overall goals that we want to achieve in such a policy and also think about specific issues that we might want the policy to address. Um, and that was, that was it. Okay, thank you, Anne. The Building Committee, uh, Elaine? Uh, yes, um, the Building Committee um, met last week. Uh, we had a presentation by HKTA uh, and Tom Greer, the engineers. Um, we had a discussion regarding the front of the design of the high school building and the signage. Uh, we also, uh, as Jeff had talked about, um, saw some designs of the locker room configurations and also some of the layouts of the science labs, um, differentiating between chemistry and uh, biology and uh, physics, and um, there was also an updated timeline as far as the Pond Cove process for the hiring of a contractor. Um, the ads have gone out uh, regarding the qualifications for contractors, and uh, we are right on, on target as far as uh, the budget for the renovate, I mean the new addition. And we will still be looking at a May-June start date for the Pond Cove edition. Um, and then lastly, the um, a building committee took up uh, some of the issues regarding uh, concerns over the traffic situation in front of the high school. Um, but it was uh, ultimately decided that it was not an issue that needed to be taken up at that level uh, by the building committee. Um, and then just as an update in regards to the high school hiring of our uh, construction manager, um, as, you, as I reported, the uh, subcommittee of the building committee um, had recommended the hiring of Peyton, and the contract is still being looked at uh, by our attorneys, um, and we are uh, uh, passing on, a, a, I guess, a statement that we're looking for approval of that. Um, by the town council and for a reading um, later on tonight okay. uh, for approval by the school board. So uh, that's where we stand as far as building. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, communication committee, Ann? That committee has not met since our last board meeting. There will be a meeting on March 31st at 315 in the Pond Cove Media Center for anybody who would like to join us. Okay, thank you. Um, and now on to unfinished business, um, the high school um, traffic intersection. Uh, yes, I, I have um, before the school board a, a copy of a letter that I have drafted that I'm interested in having the school board send to the Cape Elizabeth Town Council uh, along with the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. Um, as I had mentioned, uh, there's been some discussion regarding some traffic studies that have been conducted uh, that have covered the intersection of Route 77 and the entrance to our high school. Um, there has been no, um, it, the, the studies were done in conjunction with our building project, but also done independently by the town council to address the, an ongoing traffic situation. Um, our, my concern is that the planning board will be taking these traffic studies um, into consideration when approving uh, or disapproving our project. 
and I wanted the school board to uh, make a statement that, um, that we do appreciate that these traffic studies are available and that we, it is an ongoing problem and that we would like to see the, the traffic safety issue addressed by the town council. On the other hand, we also feel that we do not want to jeopardize the timeline of our renovation and our Pond Cove project and the ultimate approval of this project, and so that we would ask the planning board um, to, to um, not delay approval of our projects based on these studies. So that's what the letter is. Uh, I do um, have all the attachments that you receive, which are basically just some of the supporting documents, which are letters from parents and minutes of our past meetings that go into detail about the ongoing problem and the fact that we um, are concerned for the safety of our students and the liability that uh, both the town and the schools have if anything were to happen with a documented failed intersection. So um, I'm hoping tonight that we can get a, a vote um, on the part of the school board that um, we could have this um, signed and, and sent on to those two committees. So, so the packet as it is in our committee, I mean in our packet, is what will be forwarded to the planning board and the town council tomorrow after this evening's meeting, after we take a vote. Yes. Correct. Okay. Um, can we take a vote to um, approve um, Elaine's letter and forward it on to the town council and the planning board. Do we have a motion? I move that we forward all the information on in our packet and sign the letter and send that to the planning board as presented in our packet. Okay. Second. I second it for discussion purposes. Um, I have a question uh, in reference to the letter, uh, and I understand. Um, from reading it that we're not actually taking a stand on um, what the resolution is. Uh, and I guess I'm concerned that we're not taking a stand. Um, my question is, if we're not taking a stand, who is going to take a stand? And are we just bouncing this back and forth? Do we really want to resolve the problem? Um, or are we just sort of bouncing it back to them and they're going to bounce it back to us and are we going to actually um, hold up the planning board's decision to approve our projects? Um, and I'm, at, I'm throwing that out as a question to mm -hmm. the group because I know I'm fairly, fairly new to this process. I have gone through the traffic studies, both of them, and the letter. And I'm just concerned if we as a school board are not taking a stand as to what we think the resolution might be, and I don't know what that resolution is, but are we just bouncing it back and forth, sort of rubber balling it back and forth, and, and uh, I, I'd be interested in what other folks have to say about that. Um, Kevin? Let me try and respond directly to your questions, Kathy. The, the issue of public safety at that intersection has been raised more than a few times over the years that I have been on this board. And in each case, we have referred that to the council with a request that the council form a committee to study the issue and recommend solutions. Um, since public safety does not fall within the purview of the school board. Um, and I'm certain that people would take umbrage and have taken umbrage at the thought that we would make such an inexpert recommendation. I have served on one of those committees and was immediately informed in not quite so many words that a traffic light was not on the table for political and expense reasons. Um, because of the number of people in town who are so adamant about traffic lights and that the installation of traffic lights would cause, among other things, a change in the character of the community. Um, we also talked about a police presence, and it was made very clear to us 
that there would not be a police presence at that location um, over considerations of overtime pay and other events that typically occur at that time of the morning. Well, with those two options off the table, it seemed to me that it was worthless to have any, any meaningful conversation. There was no meaningful conversation left. The alternative was uh, what I characterized at the time as a penny-ante solution, which was opening Jordan Way to a test. Um, so I endorse what we're doing in terms of the ongoing reluctance of anyone to address this issue. We have, in fact, as a board, addressed this issue. We have addressed it in writing to the appropriate municipal officials. Thank you. Is that in the packet that we just received before we came out here? Um, it should be. Yes. I'm sorry, what? That's in the packet. The, yes. Our, I'm the, the supporting documents the supporting, are there. Okay. Yes. yes. I'm, I'm, Your two traffic studies were you received we on have those the already. previous week. Yes. But the supporting documents, I mean, in, in all fairness, we haven't had a chance to go over those because we just got those this evening. Yes, and I realize that, and I, and I, if anyone had wanted to look at them, they could have gotten them this morning. But I, they really, those aren't really pertinent to what we're asking for. They're just simply the supporting documents that are just basically parents. Um, um, I reference them in there as the, the letters from the parents and the minutes that we've addressed it. it. It's really the content of the letter that I'm looking for your approval on. Now, what about the, um, the town center inspect, intersection improvement study that was done in December of 2003? Mm -hmm was prepared for the town of Cape Elizabeth. In their executive summary, mm -hmm. they indicate at the Cape Elizabeth <coughs> High School Drive intersection with Route 77, we have determined that the intersection meets warrants for a traffic signal. Mm -hmm. That's one study. They also have, an, the planning board also has another study that was done on 2001 uh, for the community services building uh, project in which they had recommended a uh, passing lane um, so the planning board currently and the town council have two studies in addition to the Casey and Godfrey study, which we have that references them, that has two different solutions for a similar or an ongoing traffic. We are not the, the resident experts for a, a, high, a, a Route 77 intersection problem. So therefore, as answering your question, I did not feel um, that we were in a position to make that judgment um, because we are ultimately not responsible for it. Um, oh, I agree that we're not the, you know, that we, we're not the uh, knowledgeable group. I guess I'm just thinking that since these folks that just did the study mm -hmm. um, less than three months ago mm -hmm. are, are the knowledgeable group, why we're not taking their recommendation? Well, they didn't recommend any, the, the group that did for the, uh, for the building project? Casey and Godfrey did not recommend. No, I'm not She's solution. referencing the town. I'm referencing the one that the was just council. done in December. The Casey and Godfrey one is, is three years, three and a half years old. No. Right? That's well, no. the Casey and Godfrey for the community services is three years old. The Casey and Godfrey that was done for our building project, which is also in that packet, okay, um, is the one that really just looks at our on-site traffic for the high school renovation. Um, and the, when was that one done? It was just done. Last, last month. It's the, it's the latest. Yeah. Okay. It's, okay. So that was. But it doesn't good. reference anything but the internal traffic. Internal traffic. So it doesn't reference the intersection. It it just makes reference to that there is a study that was completed by the town. And it uh, acknowledges the ongoing traffic right. problem. But that our building project is not causing is not the cause of an, a significant increase in the number of passengers. Uh, to change that situation, which is already a bad situation. But if we're expecting an increase in student population in the high school, which we've said in our projections, right? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that increase um, relate to an increase, a potential increase in it would, in but, traffic? Not, but according to the, the standards that they use, that are um, the Department of Transportation standards, not to the point that it's so significant that it's considered a a change that would warrant us to do anything differently than we're doing right now. Okay. I, I would support a letter being sent. Um, I don't, at this point, I don't think it's 
really if anything it might jump start some reaction but i don't see any particular harm or serious consequence of just getting our voice heard at least getting some thoughts expressed pretty quickly here well and and our voice as a school board is that i i in this letter we're acknowledging that you know this is a dangerous situation it's a dangerous intersection and we have had um going back to um the fall of 2002 letters from parents um a committee that was started um and just recently just this past september another letter for an almost accident with a middle school student on a bicycle so the school board um is very concerned about the danger of the situation um and it needs to be addressed you know one way or another but we're not saying what it is that needs to be done Right? Well, I, I mean, we're saying there's a problem, and it looks like there's a lot of people saying there's a problem, but is anybody saying, what do we do to fix it? Because that's not what I'm seeing. Well, Wilbur anything. Smith says a traffic light. Right. The, right. The group that Wilbur the town Smith council saying, yeah. hired to do the study right. says a traffic light. So, but that puts it in the town council's court. Either they can live with that recommendation that the experts said, or they can choose a different one. Right. Okay. Okay. The choice of what to do is the town councils. And I'm sending this to the plan planning board because the choice of our project um, is based on the planning board approval or right. And, they, and yeah. they have these studies in hand. Mm -hmm. So, um, Kathy, is there some particular language in that letter that you think might assuage some of the stuff that you're concerned? I'm just concerned that the letter says. We as the school board recognize that there's a problem and, and you know, we think that something needs to be done. But we're not really jumping off the, off the dock, as it were, and saying what we're supporting as to be done. And I'm sure that that is a, a huge discussion and there's probably lots of differing opinions, even among us, as to my, what might be done. I, you know, again, I'm new to the situation, so I'm not sure I've had enough chance to review it. I'm just thinking that I guess my feeling is is that the letter is not specific enough to do anything but maybe continue to aggravate the situation that looks like it's been being bounced back and forth. And I that's my I guess that's my real concern is I don't wanna send a letter that they're gonna that the town council, the planning board is gonna go, Yeah, yeah, we know, we've heard them say that there's a problem, but who's going to say what the solution is or who's going to maybe get together and come up with a solution because I think that's what we want to do is we want a solution, right? I mean, we, I think we all agree that we want a solution and maybe we don't agree with what that solution is. Okay. Kevin? Yeah. Um, for the record, the school board representative to the traffic committee, traffic study committee, me, very strongly urged the consideration of a traffic light at that location. And it was equally strong in the response that the council representative responded, that that was not doable in terms of money and politics. So we have gone on record as to what we felt would be, should be done and have been repeatedly rebuffed that a traffic light is not an alternative. Well, no, the board has never gone on record. No, no the you board didn't. has. The representatives of the board, i.e. Tom and myself, as well, and Tom did not make a recommendation on it. Tom stayed neutral. But also the parent representatives were pretty <coughs> strong about the, the, the same types of solutions. And every solution that we offered was rebuffed as being not cost effective. Um, so I don't see what else that we should do. I, I mean, we've been told on the one hand it's not in our purview to make those recommendations. Um, Elaine? I, I just, um, just a little bit further information um, is because the town council is going to make the ultimate decision on this, um, and I wanted to get a statement from the school board that we wanted it addressed because they have the tools in hand to make the decisions. Um, that's 
I found out on, on Monday or Friday that they were going to be having a workshop addressing that tra those traffic studies. They've had them since December, and they finally put it on their workshop schedule. So that's why I wanted a statement in hand um, with all the supporting documentation about it being ongoing. And so now they will have it in their hands, and they will make a decision. And, and what they do is, is really up to the town council. Okay. Is there language that can be placed in a letter to uh, accommodate some of, or at least what Kathy's essentially saying, saying we hope this doesn't become uh, some kind of a verbal ping pong match and that there is closure on this issue and done in an expeditious manner so it doesn't prompt another response or prompt no response? I, I understand what Kathy's saying, and I think maybe if there is some language that could suggest, could we get this moved quickly here? Are you opposed to placing that language in your letter? I, um, I'm not the person that wants to add that to that to, to the le to the letter. So you're, you are opposed to that language. I, I think I cover in the letter what needs to be covered. If Kathy would like to pose a, a statement that we could you know listen to, I. Um, but what what is it about the language that is it? You, are you saying that you you don't want to even go that direction? Or? I, I don't think we're encouraging a ping pong. Um, match. I think okay. we're simply saying that this is a concern. Um, the town council has the ability to, to, to address it, and we would like them to address it. And that the planning board is going to make a decision, and we hope it doesn't delay the project. Those are the two things I felt that as a school board, we needed to communicate. Uh, the planning board will be meeting on March 16th, and the town council will be meeting on the 18th. Um, and I agree with Elaine. I mean, I, I feel that this um, letter to go to the planning board and the town council um, states our position in terms of um, that we would like to see something done for the safety of our students and the decision um, will be made review by the whether it's made by the planning board or the town council, they need to review all of these traffic studies um, and the recommendations that the people who have made the traffic studies have done. Okay, Our, you know, we can go on and debate this forever, um, but I, I think we can get to a vote. To, yes, to send it out. There's a second. The, yeah. Kathy had seconded, seconded it. it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. All those in favor of sending this on to the planning board and the town council? Richard, are you? Uh, no, I'm going to abstain. Thank you. Just You're going to abstain? Yeah. Okay. Um, all those opposed? Okay. One, two, three, four. Four in favor. Um, one not in favor and one abstention. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now we can move on to uh, new business. Um, consideration of a recommendation from the um, building committee regarding the construction uh, management company. Um. Do you have it? I yeah. have it right here. Sorry, I uh, should have pulled that out before. I thought I did have it right here. The packets are too big this month. <laughs> no, I know. While you're looking, um, here it is. you have a, the letter that you're looking for is a letter um, from, from Elaine. Um, to the school board and to the, um, um, there is also a similar letter to the um, town council because both groups need to approve the construction management firm. And at the end of that packet, um, there's a letter and there's also um, a little bit of information about patent construction. And at the end of that packet is a, um, 
sample motion that was given to us by school attorney which could be used for approval we also need to prove at the same time to enter into a contract once we have approval from the town's attorneys and have a contract that's acceptable to the to the school's attorney for our architect HKTA which we've already approved his contract for on Cove and now we have a similar contract with the architect for the high school renovation project and I don't know Lane if you and I don't know if you've talked to the board yet about the process you went through to get the payment so maybe that might be something you want to do. Sure I think I talked a little bit about the building committee had assigned a subcommittee to interview and advertise for construction managers for the high school project we received 12 firms who are interested in in participating in the interview the initial cut in that from the 12 down to the five that we interviewed set up a list of criteria that the building subcommittee felt was important to defining a successful construction management firm that ranged from things such as experience in in school projects and phasing to safety issues because you were dealing with an occupied building to the fee structure and they were all weighted and we conducted the interviews and asked them to bring their project supervisors and their project managers so that we could meet them one-on-one because they were such an integral part of the working relationship that we would have with the construction management firm it was a very successful a very fair process we had a good committee of school officials and some excellent help in the way of some building subcommittee members who are very experienced in the construction field so they brought a lot of insight for us their final recommendation was for Peyton construction company out of Sarko they've done a variety of school projects that you had in your packet that ranged from the current Greeley Junior High School Kennebunk school systems and work in the main principals association the Raymond Elementary School we also did get very strong recommendations also regarding their work so like Tom had said that the contract is now at the our legal offices and we would be looking for approval from the school board pending approval from our lawyers to go forth with that contract for the high school renovation project so our approval tonight then gets forwarded to the town council is that correct I don't believe it gets forwarded to the town council they have the same information of which they will be making their recommendation to go forth or not with the contract the two don't hinge together do they Tom you need approval from both sides yeah okay question council met last night was this on their agenda it was on their agenda did they approve it they did not I'm old no I'm sorry I should take that back they tabled it they are looking good enough for me yeah they were very clear I understand that they did not want to hold the project up and I don't believe there's any reason to believe that it will they were looking for some more information regarding Peyton they actually want the signed contract and we will we'll have that and they are willing to work with us to get it approved just to clarify contract signed by whom by Peyton I think because right now there are a few issues that are still in the that remain with the lawyers is yeah our attorneys in the Peyton it's just a process we need to go through our insurance our insurance company we're getting information from them on some of the issues so that there the problem is that if we 
if we don't get approval to move ahead because we're hoping that in short order we'll have all of all of those the attorneys and insurance company all on the same page which is part of the motion we're waiting till April and we really want to get the construction management firm on board and taking a look at the project and part of their job is to help us with the phasing of the project what needs to happen first as they'll be working closely with the architect so a lot of that work needs to begin as soon as possible and if we wait to April just it'll just be that much further away before we can start that well how can they begin anything if we approve the contract but the council doesn't the council will have another meeting prior their meeting you know two weeks and aren't we meeting in two weeks they're meeting in two weeks of their and it's on there actually I think it's on their March 18th agenda to approve it that that's next week next week okay so I'll make the motion and then we'll we'll vote on it I'd like to make a motion that the superintendent of schools be and hereby is authorized to execute and deliver a contract for construction management services with Peyton Main Corporation for the high school renovation project which contract shall be in a form acceptable to the superintendent of schools and which shall also provide for the development of a guaranteed maximum price that adequately provides for the completion of the project within the 7.9 million dollar budget approved by the voters do we have a second I second that okay any further discussion or comments I'll be happy to meet whenever and wherever but I will not vote in favor of this tonight we do not have a signed contract we're trying to we are recommending that Tom authorize be authorized to execute the contract but we don't have a, a, a finalized contract to look at in terms of reviewing the, the terms is that what I'm understanding you folks are saying do we know when we'd get that contract um, we're hoping Pauline when are we looking with that Hopefully within a week or two. We're waiting to hear from the attorneys if we do a contract. I get, then I guess my question is why would we vote on it tonight if we don't have that signed contract? Why would we not postpone that until we had the contract with the attorney's approval and we knew exactly what was in it? Um, and you can do, I mean, if well, you want to postpone it, you can do that. I'm just asking the question because yeah. I'd be. Um, in the past when we have we've had contracts with the architect and with um, other other con contracts we haven't actually physically brought the contract here for review but if you choose to do that you know that is something you can do we just haven't this hasn't been past practice um, we, we leave that up to our attorneys um, Pauline and I both review it um, to be honest with you the expertise that we rely on is more with the attorneys rather than with the school right. board and and with myself uh, because what we're looking for and what attorneys look for uh, is, is much different so we rely on outside expertise to do that but we can if it's something you'd like to see and review yourself that's something you can do well I wouldn't imply that I had the ability to look at the contract but I guess I would if you had made the um, the proposal subject to the attorney's approval um, which I didn't see that in here um, in your motion I guess that that would be a, I would consider that a different consideration um, the way um, you've proposed it here I'd, I'd be with um, Kevin I don't think I could approve that if I didn't know that that attorney clause was going to be in there and, and you can add that this this actually was written by our attorneys because we asked them what should the motion be they and probably they assumed they had already approved it when they got yeah. this maybe yeah. so okay. you know you can add that language if you'd like in there. I, I would happily vote in the affirmative if there was a contingency for pending the attorney's approval and then I would further direct somebody from here to get on the phone with the attorneys tomorrow and tell them to move it we're paying for it 
either approve it or don't approve it. I would vote in the affirmative, too, as long as that, that there was a clause in the motion that indicated yeah. pending attorney's approval. I'd have no problem with that. I, I, um, I would support that also. I, I felt that it was a little bit implied that Tom and Pauline, um, as mentioned in here, would, would not consider it without the approval of the attorney. And maybe it was just, I was thinking, I knew it was in the legal office and, and that it was there, but uh, how would the wording, with, you want to change the motion to say, in a form acceptable to the superintendent of schools and pending approval by legal counsel. 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 Mm -hmm. And which shall also provide the development of the maximum price. I can read it in its entirety. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Okay. First, uh, the, you, you probably should make uh, an amendment to the motion before you start clarifying the government, right? Sure. Can you help me with that, Richard? Um, just, just offer. You can offer an, an amendment to your current motion and then read that right okay. now. Okay. I'd like to um, offer an amendment to the current motion that's being considered uh, to read as follows. Uh, that the superintendent of schools be and hereby is authorized to execute and deliver a contract for construction management services with Peyton Main Corporation for the high school renovation project, which contract shall be in a form acceptable to the superintendent of schools and pending the approval of legal counsel, and which shall also provide for the development of a guaranteed maximum price that adequately provides for completion of the project within the $7.9 million budget approved by the voters. I would second that. Okay. All those in favor? 6 0. Thank you. Thank you. And we have um, several policies. Uh, for first reading tonight? Yeah, I just wanted to possibly suggest that in light of the fact that we have two parents who are interested in speaking on this one policy and in light of the fact that the board member conflict of interest and nepotism might take oh, some time that we change the order in which they're presented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, then what we'll first be addressing is the policy which is uh, uh, the title of which is awarding of high school course credit prior to grade nine. As I mentioned earlier in our policy committee report, um, a parent did contact us and really at the crux of the issue is that um, according to our current policy, middle school students who um, take courses prior to entering high school um, cannot get high school credit for those courses. And before I just ask you to, to uh, speak. Um, what the committee did want to recommend is that it's, it that it stands behind the current policy as it now reads with one exception and that is just simply and this is in the bold letters in your um, in your packet here and the just the addition is to specify when a student actually becomes a high school student and what we're recommending is that point would be fall, you know, the fall, the beginning of the school year, the time at which they actually begin high school, um, not when they finish eighth grade. So that would be an addition to our recommended policy. So I don't know, is this the point at which we ask our guests to make comments? Yes. I, I, I think you can come up and just state your name. My name is uh, Chip Kelly. I, I tried to contact Tom about this today. We missed phone calls. Um, I was aware that this was going to be on the agenda until yesterday. I didn't make the motion to bring it up, but um, affected by it, I think my name is Chip Kelly, and I have three boys in the school system, Peter in eighth grade, Patrick in fifth, and Eamon in first. And this really affects or pertains to Peter, who's uh, now in eighth grade and uh, was identified by his then first grade teacher, at the time was Gigi Zimprich. I can't recall what her name became. She got remarried and moved away, but she uh, called us and, uh, when he was in first grade and said, uh, this boy has some exceptional ability, dragged us into Tom's office and really kind of badgered Tom into moving him ahead a couple of years in math. 
and it's worked out very well since then. He descended on Nancy a couple years early. She accepted him when he was in third grade. And uh, he's now taking algebra two in the high school uh, and has an AA plus average and finds it fairly pedestrian, I guess. It's, so he's got the accelerated ability. And um, when he got his, um, his, his calendar for the year, or his schedule for the year last fall, before the school year started, that's when I first was made aware of the, of the policy. Because in his package saying, you'll have math in the first period of the high school at 7.30 in the morning, whatever it is, it also stated that uh, the policy, the letter that states the policy that you will not get high school credit for having that class. And I was really perplexed by that. Didn't pursue it at the time. When I found out this was on the agenda tonight, though, I thought I'd come and speak. And at least, uh, not so much speak, but also hear um, why the policy is in place and, and what, it, what the purpose of it is. It seems to me that it doesn't really promote children challenging themselves to their ability. And in fact, it's a detriment. If you're taking a course that you're capable of passing, regardless of your age or what school you're in, you should be given credit for that. And that seems a logical conclusion. And the antithesis, the opposite of that, seems illogical. So that's really the point I wanted to make this evening. I, I don't know the genesis of the policy or how long it's been in place, but. And the I policy committee did, did, did speak to this. And one of the issues that, that, is, that does complicate this is Chapter 127 of the state statutes does not allow us to grant high school credit before you get to high school. Is that a state statute? Yeah. Now, what we do do, and Jeff can, can speak to this, that... Well, why uh, is that, though? I mean, how long has that been in place? Um, well, Chapter 1, that's the Chapter 127 has been, uh, there's a new version of that where it doesn't mention, doesn't even mention it. So it's kind of, we don't, that's what the statute has always said. Um, with the learning results and some of the changes in the statute, it's not addressed in the new statute at all. So we're not clear on what the, the law is now. Um, but we have kids, and Nancy can answer, we have kids on a regular basis that do take, I think every year, um, I know we've had sometimes up to five or six kids that go to the high school to take He's classes. the only one this year. Right. But, I mean, it's, it's a regular occurrence. But, and what happens is, it's a, it, is not, it is noted on their transcript that they've taken the course. So it doesn't hurt them at all. It actually is a, something that the colleges would look at and say, wow, you know, this child took these classes already. Now they come into high school into FST or a different math class. So I don't think it's a detriment at all for them. But what's been driving a lot of it was, um, I think a lot of that was, was state statute. Um, and then what the rationale behind it from the high school other than state statute, Jeff or, or Nancy might speak to that. I, I, somewhat, I mean, there, there is, if there's a statute in place and we're adhering to that, that's fine. But still, the statute itself doesn't seem logical. And my question still What's the genesis is out there. Of that? Right, I, exactly. I and I, it doesn't seem logical either. Yeah. I, I can't speak to what the genesis of the statute is. It's actually a regulation. Regulation. Department of Education regulation that has been enforced for a long time. Um, I have no idea what the original business was behind it. Um, what we tried to do was to include on the transcript some reflection that the child has has achieved this, achieved it in middle school, so that a college would understand right. that they're getting a student who's sort of done something extra. I guess the question, to be honest with you, because there was a regulation that was standing behind it, I'm not sure how much stuff is wasn't a need to sort of think it through, but, but um, my concern would be that what we would potentially end up doing if we do this is that there are a number of kids who aren't just taking math, but for example, I can see an argument being made uh, that we have kids who come in, for example, at Spanish 3 and French 3 at their levels. Um, at the same time, we have kids who are coming in at French 1 and 2 levels, um, and which is the high school level and which are the middle school level. Seem to me questions that um, uh, it's nice to have a clean rule that says this is this is what high school begins. It doesn't hurt kids at all. I really don't think uh, because I, I really do think that it helps them. And on the other end, for kids who, if they were to get a number of high school credits, what it would create at the other end uh, is kids, unless they wanted to graduate early, which is something we can always talk about uh, and be flexible. Is a situation where we could have, we could potentially, before we open it up, have kids who have achieved all but 10 or 20 of their credits that they need for graduation coming in the senior year, which again is fine if we can address it with a student 
on the high school transcript through credits. Um, because I do think that creates some real open doors that I'm not sure where, where, where it goes from there. Uh, and I do think that this addresses the needs of the kid that represents what the particular student has done and the outstanding nature of what they've accomplished. Um, but the simple premise that if you take a high school class, you should receive the credit for that high school class, regardless of whether you're in high school or not. So the child, every other child in that class with him is getting credit for it, and he's not. That's, that's absolutely true. Every other child does get credit for it because, because they are in high school at that time. It seems to be detrimental, though, not. You know, in, instead of turning this into a back and forth right. um, well, it, it, discussion. It's a simple premise, I yeah. guess. And it's, while there is a regulation or statute in place, it too, I, I question that as well. Right. And if we just say because, well, because isn't an answer. I, I yes, even is. further. Um, it's not a very thoughtful answer. Let me let me clarify. Chapter one twenty seven said in the past that we were not allowed to do this. Chapter one twenty seven no longer addresses it in any way, shape, or form. It, is my understanding of that correct? That what it, from what we can see. Yeah, I, I read it and I didn't see that it was in there. And, that, okay. and that's consistent with what Chapter 127 wanted to do, which was to de-emphasize the whole issue of credits as a and No, I understand. But now let me go to a statement that you made, Jeff, that there is a Department of Education regulation in place. Well, well no. Chapter 127 is it's a great. regulation that flows from Gotcha. To, be honest, to be very honest with you, the, the legal citation to the policy was to the regulation and not to the statute. I haven't looked to see in, in, in the statutes whether there was something. My, I just looked at the regulation. I guess my question to whoever is, I should address this question is, is there is or is there not a Department of Education relation, uh, regulation in place today that says we cannot do it? If that regulation's in place, then we have no choice but to obey the regulation. Well, I, and if I the think regulation's not in place, then there's a philosophical question and, 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 and a, a philosophical debate that I have no issue with. But unless I know one way or the other, I, I, don't, I don't know what we're talking about, a matter of law slash regulation versus philosophy. Yeah, nor do I. I just pose I a philosophical think... question. Okay, and, and I, I, I think your question uh, can be answered by us doing, by uh, the superintendent and or the high school principal doing a little checking um, and finding, I'm sorry? <laughs> um, uh, and finding an answer. Um, and I, is there someone else who wanted to speak as well? Are, are you okay. wanting to comment? Are, are, are also, you finished, uh, Mr. Dave. Kelly? I don't know what I have well, I, but can you come up to the um, podium, please? Uh, uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> my name is David Halge. I have two kids in school, my son Thomas, who is in the eighth grade, and the daughter Hannah, who is in the first grade. Uh, my only concern, you know, is regarding Thomas, who has been uh, sought out. Uh, actually, Nancy and, and her teachers found out that he was a talented youth and sent him to uh, John Hopkins, or John Hopkins asked him to take certain tests to find out if he was. And in fact, he did. Uh, did his SATs, etc., etc., and scored very highly. They accepted him into a summer program. Uh, for this coming summer that will allow him to take certain classes at Johns Hopkins, which everybody will get credit for other than in our school system. Uh, my only concern, I guess, is if he does take these and he does pass them and does well, which we expect he will, will there be a notation on his transcripts that in fact he took some uh, high school credit courses and although we can't give him credit for them, will there be any reference to it in his transcript to his college applications, uh, backing that up. I, I would have to know more about the... Jeff, do you want to come up? Sure. Oh, I, 
I don't really have a definite answer to that question. It really depends on the circumstances. There is a provision for allowing students who are in the high school to get credit for things. It's um, as long as there is prior a prior request to do it, and we can figure out what the circumstances are. You, typically, it's for students who have advanced beyond the level of courses that we offer in the high school. Math is the most common place where it is offered, and the most common one that we do offer that for is actually through a program through Johns Hopkins. I'm not sure if it's the same program that you're talking about or not. So it may be. Right. So you're um, saying in the fall, he's not going to be in the ninth grade when he goes to the summer program in the summer. Right. But, and this is part of, the, you know, speaking for myself, this is part of the issue. And I, I understand and I'm sympathetic to the request, but I'm also, I've also had an experience here over the last couple of years of various requests coming up for various things, all of which want to lead to an issuance of high school credit for things. Um, and it does become, because there are, we have wonderful parents here who want to support the educational achievements of their kids, which are which is fantastic. It does mean that at some point we have to sort of draw some lines. Um, there are lots of enrichment programs out there that some of which are wonderful, some of which are quite frankly not wonderful. Um, I've heard nothing but great things about Johns Hopkins, um, so I don't mean to suggest that that one isn't a wonderful program, but. The policy that the school board has, which we've tried to interpret, is one that tries, I think, to draw some clean lines because I fear otherwise. Um, and and I, I guess part of what I have to say is that there are the fact that, that um, programs are not all reflected in high school transcripts does not mean that they aren't considered as incredibly important. Um, in reflecting on the achievements of the students and that they aren't taken into account by, for example, guidance counselors writing recommendations, teachers writing recommendations, and colleges considering admissions. There's all kinds of ways that that information comes out. Um, high school credit is one that we try to be cautious about in saying this is one, but we need to have some relatively clean lines and some processes in place. Um, if the board chooses to change this policy and to open it up more, I mean, I don't have any philosophical problem with it. Um, so I don't have, I don't, from my standpoint, this is not a philosophical issue. To be very honest with you, from my standpoint, this is a very pragmatic issue of where are the lines, because it is critical that there be some lines, because otherwise there will be long lines of people asking us to award credit for things, um, and it's, it's going to require some very individualized discussions. So again, my, I don't have a problem with the philosophy. I don't agree with you, disagree with you philosophically, or Chip disagree with you philosophically. I understand the point, but the hat I wear suggests that I have to be very sensitive to the pragmatic issues that sort of lay behind it. Okay, thank you. Question? Um, yes, Kevin. And I don't know, again, I don't know who I'm directing this question to. Your son is going to take summer courses at John Hopkins. Yes. Does that, in and of itself, generate a transcript, a record of the, the courses he's taken? At Johns Hopkins, it will. However, yeah. my question is, will it reflect here? No, I, I understand what your question is. Well, my question then becomes, since there will be a transcript in existence, can that not be appended to his, his college application at the time that's appropriate? I think I can answer your question simply by stating that the fact that we're concerned about our son means that that will definitely be attached to any college that he applies for. Uh, we will do that. Uh, we'll also do the, the middle school last year, sent him to Washington, D.C. for the Eisenhower group, and he went to that. And everybody else in that group got college, or high school credit for that also. He did not get anything for it. That will also go to those colleges that he applies to. I guess my concern is not just for my son, but the fact that Nancy in the middle school does such a great job promoting all these extra programs. The kids really work toward getting there. At what point do we in the high school, or do we as a school board, I guess the school, the community, say we want these kids to keep going, keep trying for all these things. We want to recognize them. And I think the transcripts are a way to recognize them. That's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And, and, and I think that um, 
the, the school board has heard all of the input from the two parents and that this is um, a first reading and I, I believe that this belongs back um, in the policy committee for further discussion. Um, do you have anything no, to add to and that? No, just so you know the process, it, it will go back to the policy committee taking all the input. Um, and obviously, we, we need to get a better handle on the new Chapter 127 regulations, find out what they are, um, and then it comes back to the school board in April for a final reading, and they'll I'll vote at that time. Um, and Anne, a question: um, Will this be? This will go back to the very next policy right. committee meeting, right? Well, I mean, I think at this point it should, since mm -hmm. we've had this level of discussion. Okay. Um, and, and that is um, an open meeting to the public, so the two of you are welcome to be at that policy meeting. Okay. And thanks to both of you for coming and taking the time to present your comments. Mm -hmm. Okay, so moving on to the, um, the next policy, board member conflict of interest. I think in your um, in your, your packets, you have the, um, the top says the menu of possible changes, and then I know tonight you got handed the original policy, which is currently what we're operating under, board member conflict of interest. So there are four paragraphs here. They're on, under this policy, there are really minor changes that are being recommended. Um, I guess in this case, I'll just give you a minute to look through it, see if you have any comments. I mean, one case, there's a typo. There's a um, clarification of what secondary interest can be. And then in the third paragraph, it addresses um, board members as volunteers um, in primary roles in the schools. So if, you, if we just want to take a minute, I guess, if there are comments on this. So this is the first reading, so we're just looking at this for the first time, taking comments, suggestions, and then we'll take that back to the policy committee this next month. Nothing really, just, nothing really significantly changes the main intent of our current policy in these changes. So does anybody have any comments or suggestions or thoughts that you'd like to carry to our next policy committee meeting? Okay. Okay, so then the next one is the nepotism. This one is a little bit more complicated because there are a number of, of changes. There are additional paragraphs. Um, and there are options within some of the paragraphs that present different approaches um, to them. So I think, I'm thinking that probably with this one, we might take this paragraph by paragraph because it gets a little bit more complicated, if that sounds right. Um, I think at the crux of this issue, and I mentioned this at our, at our last school board meeting, is um, under our current policy, we, um, refer to the hiring of next of kin, um, which we are suggesting that we change to immediate family, mainly a language change. But under one of our um, options under this first paragraph is to um, extend that prohibition to hiring to immediate family. And further in this policy, we do define um, extended family and immediate family. So I mean, one of the things to think about is that one of the options is to keep it as is, which is to just prohibit the hiring of immediate family. A second option is to extend that to extended family. Um, and then a third option is to allow the hiring of extended family with the um, knowledge and approval of the school board. So that is, that's the first, that's really just sort of the first paragraph that we're looking at. Are there comments, thoughts, suggestions on those, clarifications? So you are looking um, to us to have a, a, a consensus amongst the board 
of um, whether it is just immediate family, immediate family, and extended family. Mm -hmm. Correct? Right, that's option two. Okay. Um, and the third option is to allow extended family. To allow extended family, but with the um, approval, with the um, notification and approval of the school board, the prior notification and approval of the school board. I'd like to point out, though, that further on in this document, there's a um, paragraph, a new paragraph, that were, if we were to choose, if the board was wanting to go with option two, which is to not allow the hiring of immediate or extended family members, there would be an exception paragraph, which would allow for an exception in certain cases that the school board might make under certain circumstances, when an exception might be deemed necessary in the event of maybe in the um, coach, maybe we're trying to hire coaches, we can't find somebody, but we do have um, an extended family member who is interested in applying for that. The board could then make an exception to our policy if in fact we were, go we were voting for the option two, which would prohibit the hiring of extended family members. There would be a policy, uh, there would be a paragraph that would allow for that exception to occur. So I guess the reason why we're presenting these three options is because we have kind of explored this for a couple of months and there ha is no consensus on the policy committee for which of these options to, to go with. So we decided that we had to bring forth three separate options to the full board for your input. So I guess right now if there's some discussion that, that people would like to have. Um, does anyone want to start? Kevin? I, I just, no, I, I need to clarify what we're doing here because this is so different from anything we've ever had to do with a policy before. Typically, a policy comes out with a consensus from the mm -hmm. policy committee, and on occasion, we as board members shoot it full of holes or indicate, you know, that we're, we're generally in agreement with the way it is so that it comes out for a second reading. I just want to be clear that what we're being asked to do is express our opinion on which option we individually prefer here so that the committee can take that into consideration. I, I That's think right. that, that is what we're asking you to do, Kevin, because what's happened on the committee is that we have reviewed this, we've had our legal counsel review this, they've come up with a separate policy, we then threw that policy out. We've kind of approached this from a number of different angles. But the essence is that there is no consensus on the policy committee in terms of which policy to bring forth. And rather than continuing in that venue to discuss it any further, we decided to take this approach. I recognize that it's a bit unconventional. Oh, I, I can deal with the unconventional part. I just want to make sure that I, I and everybody else understands what we're being asked to do. Mm -hmm. So we're not, well, I won't go there. But I just want to make sure I understand what I'm being asked to do here right. so I don't overstep my bounds. Right. So we're being asked to um, voice our opinions on option one, two, or three. Right. In that case, um, I fully support option number two with the proviso for the opportunity of an appeal and exception. And that would be um, option number two. further down. There would be an exception. Yeah, after, after, after every effort has been exhausted, if, if I remember correctly, and the only person who could possibly fill the position turns out to be a relative, that that would come to the board to be specifically approved, thereby raising that to, mm -hmm. to its highable, highest level of public transparency. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Um, did you want to? I will, I'm ready. Okay. Uh, I would support uh, making the recommendation back to the policy committee uh, for uh, option two also. Um, I, um, I believe it needs to be an extended family situation. I also need uh, 
i believe the exception needs to be added to the policy and option three is it just creates more problems than we need to go to Kathy do you want me to go okay I I would support option one I'll tell you why I don't support option two which I'm sure will come of no surprise to any of you first of all let's I want to make sure that we're clear that the nepotism policy refers to school board members and the superintendent it does not refer to administrators which was discussed at one point in time I think that there was an administrator that had a concern about an extended family member this policy does not cover that no actually that's not correct in paragraph two your this paragraph does not cover that but that this is a policy paragraph two if you look down is administrators but this policy BCC in our policy book is under board members there is a separate policy in another section and that policy is GCF in terms of professional staff hiring and that references back to candidates employed and positions where evaluations are going to be made by a family member and that I believe was the concern that I heard reference but the BCC policy that we have that we're discussing is a board member and superintendent policy so if we're going to change that I want to want to recognize that that is an additional change to include administrators having said that I object to the addition of the extended family member in reference to board members board members supervise one person and that is the super that is the superintendent the board school board does not supervise directly anybody else in the school department I think as Ann excuse me as Jen DeSena had mentioned also that by electing option two we may be deterring potential candidates from applying for positions if we have a policy in place that says we will not not allow extended family members of school board members to occupy positions then we have already said to people up front we will not entertain your application looking at it later on is an exception I don't think covers it main school management does not include extended family members and their recommended policy for nepotism the main statute title 20 a section 1002 only includes spouses of school board members as being excluded from being employed by the school department the main school law for board members written by Drummond Woodson only includes spouses of board members as being precluded I looked at four of the surrounding town schools Falmouth Westbrook Scarborough and South Portland they only include spouses as being excluded from employment and I want to go back for a minute to the main statute and the inclusion of a spouse no I'll go back to that so I would like to and I would also in in looking at whatever the policy committee decides as a final policy for this I would urge the school board to get a legal opinion a written legal opinion from Drummond and Woodson supporting that policy because this policy if it is approved with option two will be very outside of the norm of any other policy for which we have references any other school policy in the area the state statute Drummond and Woodson's recommendation in main school management we and that excuse me I'm sorry and if I could go back to the to the exception part that was recommend what that was being referenced earlier my understanding is that we cannot make an exception to the spouse policy 
the state statute which states that a spouse of a school board member cannot be employed is not something that we can make an exception to now if we do put the exception clause and i guess i can am concerned about that as well aren't we setting ourselves up for arbitrary decisions to be made by the school board based on the group of people the time this the situation and isn't that arbitrary decision subject to to criticism by the public or or anybody else so anyway that's what i want to say i was just going to interject that we did contact german with them recently and tom spoke to them and it they we asked them about the legalities of going either way on that on this and i mean tom you can speak to that but they what were the i understand what you're saying it makes a lot of sense but as far as we're not doing anything that's illegal um they they don't recommend one or the other is where the, where we would like to go policy does not depend on a uh, statute uh, policy is what the school board would like to do as long as you don't break any laws you can create the policy and I'm, i'm not saying that we are but i guess i am questioning why we're going there um and i guess that that's the that's the bottom line for me having stated the information as to why i think we shouldn't be going there my question comes back to why are we considering going there well, i think we're conversation that, that we had i know in some detail at the policy committee meeting um with several examples so um, i mean there have been issues that have come up which is why we're considering going there well i know that one issue i when i asked what issues they were i the, you gave me an example without names of one issue and that issue was in reference to a, um an administrator so that's why i was um making the differentiation between school board member superintendent policy and um if we're going to be adding administrators then i think that you know that needs to be looked at in terms of that is another whole addition to the policy and i don't want that to be um you know set aside as it's just sort of like we're all lumping it together because up to this point in this section of our policy manual this refers to school board members and superintendent it does not it, it is not does not add the um administrators so well we are suggesting that we add administrators under this policy okay so moving on mm-hmm, kevin just <clears throat> Kathy brings up a point that I think bears looking at in terms of language and that's that exception. She's certainly absolutely right legally that we cannot make an exception for spouses. So I don't have the actual copy in front of me tonight, but that that exception language may need to be wordsmithed so it doesn't appear that we're presuming we can make an exception for spouses that's number 1 and number 2 is barring that if the exception issue becomes a problem i then i would oppose the exception issue i mean where i am is i want i really want no exceptions i am tired 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 of the accusations that go around through this town of nepotism and other issues um that may or may not have any basis in fact whether it's for board members whether it's for administrators or anyone else um i i'm i'm just tired of being an open target for charges of favoritism um and i want to avoid that and i i think our administrators are in the same position as well um and is that it? did everyone give their comments cuz richard I'm you're part of the yeah the community well, um do we can need- i say yeah. something um <laughs> i i would um be in favor of option 2 as well but but there are a few things that i i would like to clarify when when kathy says that um this nepotism um policy is in two sections are we looking at the other policy that we have in place We haven't looked at that. This is a yeah, this one it has to this policy has to do with hiring. Okay, so so the 
how are they connected then? What is the reference to how they're well, connected? The other one has to do, I think, is super, supervision. Okay, um, because we, I heard you say that we are adding administrators to this, so it is school board members, um, school board members, superintendent, and administrators. Okay, then I'm fine with option two. Now, but I have another question. As far if you're saying that the other policy um, talks about supervision. Um, and, and I guess, and maybe I'm uh, confused in combining both of them, but I, I'm not sure when you get to the exception clause that you were talking about, I'm not sure that there should be any exceptions to the policy. Um, I, I do agree with Kathy in a sense that, um, you know, how does how does a decision come back to the board and the people that are on the board at the time how are they basing the decision that they're making you know in terms of the people involved and etc um i would like us to get to a no ex there are no exceptions um however i i'm there the the issue of supervision which this may not address um, it is that you know it is addressed I, in the other policy it is addressed in the other policy well okay so then I don't need to talk about it. all right never mind I'm just on this one because I'm confusing the two I'm sorry okay well so I can see that the exception policy is something that we need to think through a little bit more and I don't know rich I mean the, rich is on the policy committee so this and this is coming from the policy committee which is certainly open to hearing your comments if you'd like and to listening. offer them at this point I think I'm getting more value by listening to the comments okay. and what I will do too and I, I because the last time we sent this to um, legal counsel they developed a combined policy for us which they thought was the best way to go and that was rejected by the policy committee so I can send this new one again to get their opinion on it. but their opinion the last time was not to have two policies and in, to combine they thought it was best we sent them two policies they said you really should combine them into one which we didn't like or, or the policy committee didn't like so we broke it down again so I can resend it again and just ask them not to combine them and just take a look at them and give us an opinion mm -hmm. Kevin. Is, is there any real relevance to what section of the policy manual this falls under i mean let's create general policy section well there's a relevance in that that the policies are coded and it's a it's a, it's a well i i understand that but you know that's almost as arbitrary as anything else mm -hmm. okay do do people want to go and look at some of these other paragraphs i mean the that's really the crux of the discussion about this policy is what we've just talked about now we can look at the rest of these i mean there's a definition of immediate and extended family there's the exception policy which we've been talking about and there is paragraph six um, on the bottom of the third page which basically i'll just read it because it's brief it says this policy shall not apply to the hiring of part-time or seasonal employees of community services who do not report directly to the director of community services that's an additional um, paragraph the other additional thing that's in this policy that's consistent that is the one thing that our committee did agree on and that's um, adding adding language that addresses um, no sport no spouse of a school board member um, or a school board member may serve as a volunteer when that volunteer has primary responsibility within the schools. That's something that we have to put in this policy that would be an addition. It's a matter of state statute. Right. So are there other comments or thoughts? I mean, basically what we were looking for was how some of the other board members not on the policy committee felt. And it seems as though option two is what 
those board members are in favor of. So I think that that's what we'll take back to our committee. And then what that means is that we can then draft a policy that would, I think, represent option two. And that would come back to us for a second reading right. next month. At the month. next meeting, mm -hmm. the next board meeting. Okay. And then maybe Tom will also send this to our legal counsel to get their input as well. And I wanted to ask another question um, on page four, option two. Um, you're defining extended family, and in there it says in-law and cousin, and I know that there was some discussion at the policy committee, um, and I guess my, my question is that uh, maybe we look at better defining those um, in terms of what is an in-law and what is a cousin. Um, I think I used the example that at some level we're all cousins, so which cousins are we talking about? First cousins, first cousins once yeah, removed, second that's cousins? That's a good question. I don't, and I don't know in the uh, policy that Drummond and Woodson drew up for us. Does this language come from their policy that they did for us, or is that something that has been created since? I think we created that. So maybe that's something they can help us with, because I don't think that's not part of what they gave us. So okay. we need to. I just think, think that we need to clarify that. I think that's uh, open for interpretation. Okay. So are there th further thoughts or comments on this? Thank you very much yeah. for all the options and the research that went into it. You're welcome. Okay. I think that's it. That was all? Oh, that's all three of them. Okay. Um, and now we can move on to um, the superintendent's recommendations for uh, athletic fee positions. Yes, I have um, <clears throat> I think two recommendations, one at the middle school for athletic fee positions. One is an assistant track coach, Anne-Marie Dion, and at the high school, a varsity girls lacrosse coach, Sarah Kinsella. Do we have a motion to accept his recommendation? No, we accept the superintendent's nomination to athletic positions. Second. Second. Elaine, um, all those in favor? And we have um, two, and there's a, a, a typo in the costumes for the poker curricular fees, Dick Mullen, not Dick, Miss Mullen, Ms. Owen. <laughs> um, for, for, for drama, co-curricular positions, one is a tech assistant position, the other one is a costume. Do we have a motion? I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendations to co-curricular positions. And a second. Elaine, um, comments or questions? Okay, all those in favor? Six zero. Okay, and uh, lastly, the um, there's a letter in our packet from uh, the nurse at Pond Cove. What Paula Harris Paula? in the memo you have is asking for they have a nutrition advisory council uh, that's been working, and they would like. Um, if someone has the time, uh, a representative from the school board, and, and um, this is something that, this is for someone who does have the time to do that. I know we have a lot of committees and a lot of meetings, so this is entirely up to the school board and whether there is a member who has an interest in this. And, well, Tom, I would like to say that, I, I mean, I received this letter, uh, or I received a letter um, from Paula, and I'm, I'm not asking me to come to this committee, and I'm not certain what happened to it, because I misplaced it. And so when I read this in my packet um, uh, the other night, I thought, oh my God, I never responded to it. So I will be willing to go to this and be part of this group because I feel bad that I didn't respond. It was an oversight. Okay. Marie, I think we, well, most of us got that letter. We all got it. Oh, all right. Okay. <laughs> Don't feel too bad. Well, so no one else. Just let it go on. Let it go. We, too late so no one that. else responded either? Yeah. We're waiting for you. Well, I will, I will do it. Thank you. Okay. Oh. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, so that finishes everything for tonight. Okay, I'd like to just go over to um, our future meetings. I'm sorry. Was there an addition to the agenda of uh, no. item 12F? No. No? no. Okay. No. Um, okay, future meetings. Uh, the next school board workshop, March 23rd, 7 o'clock, high school library will be on the um, budget. Policy subcommittee meeting, Wednesday, April 6th, 12th noon, here in the Jordan Conference Room. The next building committee meeting, Wednesday, April 6th, 7, 7 o'clock, in the Jordan Conference Room. Our next um, finance subcommittee and regular school board meeting, April 13th. And also, I would like to mention that on uh, March 11th, is that this week? Um, uh, this Thursday, um, there is a meeting um, for uh, potential school board candidates, people who would like to run um, for school board and would like to have more information from school board members and uh, from Tom. And Kevin, that meeting is where? Tom, Georgia. Yeah, I know. Oh. I forgot what time. Okay, it's here at 6.30, I know that. Um, <coughs> okay, conference. Jordan okay. Conference Room at 6.30, and I, I think I should, probably should mention that uh, I believe March 19th is the deadline for petitions. Yes. And that is also getting very close. Okay. Question, Marie. Um, on the policy subcommittee meeting, it says Wednesday, April 6th. I'm reading this wrong. Wednesday is actually April 7th. So Actually, it's supposed Tuesday. to be Tuesday. It's Tuesday. So it's Tuesday, April 6th. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. And so if we can have um, a motion to adjourn this meeting. I move that we adjourn the business meeting and return to the public finance committee meeting and that no other business than finance will be discussed at that meeting. Okay. Um, and a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Okay. Thank you.